I graduated law school in 1968. It was at the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement, and most of us by that point were opposed to the war in Vietnam, at least most young people, certainly young men who were subject to the draft, and I was no different. I was worried about being drafted and sent to Vietnam and being killed, to be honest. But I also had been convinced by that point that it was a mistake, that the United States had no business being in that war. I ended up being hired by a group called the National Commission on Product Safety. It was a commission that was an outgrowth of the work of Ralph Nader. Uh, Ralph had become friends with Senator Warren Magnuson from Washington State at the time, and he had passed this piece of legislation. Um, and they hired four lawyers, two from Harvard and two from Georgetown, and I happened to be lucky enough to be hired as one of the two from Georgetown, and uh, ended up getting what was called a critical skills deferment. So frankly, my interest initially was not in product safety, it was simply in staying out of the Vietnam War, and this was a legal way to do it. But once I arrived at the commission, what I discovered was uh, we worked very closely with Ralph Nader. The public had not at that point uh, heard of the National Commission on Product Safety, so they didn't know to contact us, but they did know to contact Ralph. He had made a big splash, he'd come to town, and uh, mainly he published a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, and he was dealing with primarily auto safety. So people had begun to write him whenever they had a product that was dangerous or blew up or that, you know, hurt them at home. We would go over to Ralph's office at least once a week and read his mail to figure out which products were dangerous and, and what products we should focus on at public hearings, and then we would go back to the commission and do our work. Well, during the course of those two years, I wasn't that interested in product safety, but I was very impressed with the whole concept of public interest law. Uh, prior to that time, like most Americans, I thought of being a lawyer as being someone who essentially worked for private people and private companies and made a lot of money. I thought that's what lawyers did. Ralph established a different model, which is one where instead of working for individual clients, you work to try to impact public policy. I was enthralled with the idea of trying to enter that field myself, but the issue that was important to me was not product safety, it was legalizing marijuana. Frankly, I had first smoked marijuana when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School in 1965. Uh, it had become a, a significant part of my life. Uh, my friends and I were all constantly being hit on when our friends were being arrested. Those of us were lawyers. They always called us for help. So um, I thought that what I wanted to try to do was to uh, enter the field of public interest law, but to focus on how could we help legalize marijuana. So by late 1970, I started meeting with a group of friends and colleagues and discussing options on how we should set this up and uh, how we should go about trying to achieve our goals. And the end result was that by March 2nd of 71, we had filed our incorporation papers for normal. We had come up with the acronym and decided we wanted to establish a marijuana smokers lobby. And uh, so uh, my work at the Product Safety Commission was uh, incidental, but it did end up having a major impact on my decision to start normal, and again, it was primarily because of, I was impressed with the work of Ralph Nader. But it did have an impact because I saw up close that these people who uh, otherwise seemed like genuinely nice people, I socialized with them, I enjoyed their company, but they were being treated worse than violent criminals. Uh, they were looking at 10 and 20 and 30 year jail sentences where violent criminals were often getting by with suspended sentences or two or three or four or five years considered a, a major sentence. So it was clear that there was something wrong with our criminal justice system. In, uh, in the early years, without question, the two most uh, influential people on, in my life and, and in my decision to start normal were, as I mentioned first, it was uh, Ralph Nader, not because he was a smoker, he was not at all, nor did Ralph intentionally lead me in a direction of founding normal, but it was the role model he established. I was impressed by the work he was doing and I, I thought that was a higher calling than just practicing law to get rich. The other major influence was Ramsey Clark. Uh, Ramsey Clark had been U.S. Attorney General his father had been Justice Tom Clark, a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, and in fact, when President Linda Johnson appointed Ramsey as his Attorney General, uh, Justice Clark had to step aside and become a senior judge uh, because it would be a conflict every time his son obviously argued a case before the court. So Ramsey was someone who was greatly admired in this country. Uh, he had published a book 
in 1970, I believe, called Crime in America, in which he advocated the legalization of marijuana. And I had read that book, uh, and I was amazed to see someone like Ramsey Clark. Again, Ramsey, uh, I don't think he would have recognized a marijuana cigarette if he'd seen one sitting in front of him. He certainly wasn't a marijuana smoker. But he was thoughtful enough to realize that it, prohibition doesn't work. It didn't work for alcohol, and he recognized it wasn't working for marijuana. Also, by that point, he had become a major advocate of the anti-war movement. He was probably the most visible, along with Jane Fonda, uh, Ramsey Clark and Jane Fonda were the people that they traveled to Hanoi, for example, and got in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, they were the most visible and famous of the anti-war activists. And at those anti-war demonstrations, and there were a lot of them during those early years, between 65 and 68, there were at least one a year in Washington, and they attracted as many as a half a million people. So they were major protests. And at those protests, there was a lot of open marijuana smoking. It was interesting, but as people began to be disillusioned by our policy in Vietnam, they began to question other aspects of our governmental policy. And so uh, lighting up a joint and passing it around at an at a, uh, anti-war rally was considered sort of a, a second way to let the government know that we did not approve of their policies, and it wasn't just the Vietnam policy that we were unhappy with. So I, uh, I admired Ramsey, but I had never met him. I uh, used every access I had to try to get in to see him. It took a while, but eventually he was uh, kind enough to agree to see me. Um, and when we met, uh, I basically explained to him that I was seriously considering farming normal and starting the organization, but I was a little nervous. Uh, I had just completed law school. I was a, you know, a, a poor farm boy from southern Illinois. And, and in my mind, I could imagine that I might just be throwing away my entire education. I might be setting myself up for failure. So the first thing I said to, to Ramsey Clark was, uh, is this something I should be doing? Does it make sense? I was looking, obviously, for some encouragement or some reaffirmation from someone whose judgment I trusted. Uh, Ramsey surprised me without any hesitation. He said, absolutely, you should do it, which I was pleased to hear. But more importantly, he said, and you need to do it now when you're young because you can take risks like that when you're young. If things don't work out, you've still got time to get back on your feet and move ahead. But as you get a little older, and I was married and had a young child at the time, but he said those responsibilities are only going to get more complex. And you get to a point where you may not have the option of quitting your job and starting a public interest project. So. I left that first meeting with Ramsey Clark with my feet barely touching the ground. I really felt like I was floating on air. He said, yes, it's a great idea, do it, and number two, do it now. Now I ended up uh, meeting with Ramsey every few weeks for the first several months because I kept coming up with other questions that I wanted his advice on and I wanted him to join our advisory board, which he eventually did. He couldn't do it for the first couple of years because of some of the civil rights work he was also involved in and he didn't want to undermine that. But I think by 72, 73, he was a prominent member of our National Advisory Board. One of the most important roles Ramsey played was the name Normal. He loved the acronym, but when I first went to him, the acronym stood for National Organization to Repeal the Marijuana Laws. Ramsey, and I think at the time he was probably right, felt that that was needlessly confrontational. Repeal sounded like maybe you wanted no controls at all, and that might scare people. He thought reform was a more acceptable word politically, and it would still work with the acronym normal. So um, I was convinced by Ramsey Clark, and we shifted the, the name from uh, National Organization to Repeal the Marijuana Laws to National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Now, after a few years, to be honest, uh, we, we made it clear that our goal was full legalization. Uh, we were not just interested in stopping the arrest of smokers, but we wanted smokers to have a legally uh, a legal market where they could buy their marijuana from a safe and secure environment, just like alcohol drinkers do. So we had moved to a point, policy-wise, where we probably could have stayed with repeal. But at any event, uh, our name, our official name, uh, was influenced greatly by former Attorney General Ramsey Clark.